No, that's totally fine. If you want to put it um, right on your hip. No, I don't want to do
Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Lanya Jackson. I am the Director of Cultural Diversity and Belonging in the Office of Student Engagement and Inclusion. Thank you for joining us today for the celebration of women's history. Valentina Jimenez, SGA President, will serve as our MC for today's program. Valentina is a first generation Colombian American college student she lives in Danbury, Connecticut, is a senior studying biochemistry with an interest in science policy and environmental chemistry. Valentina has been heavily involved in the Student Government Association since her sophomore year, holding various senator and e-board positions. She has also been a resident assistant for two years and a red cap orientation leader. She now holds the role of leading the SGA as president. Please join me in bringing Valentina to the stage. Thank you, Lanya. I'm excited that we can be here in person today to celebrate Women's History Month. Give it up to all the women here today. Give it up to the mothers, sisters, aunts, cousins, professors, who have all paved the way. I bring greetings on behalf of the Student Government Association and the Office of Student Engagement and Inclusion. 
I would like to acknowledge our Dean of Students, Aaron Isaacs, who is present here today. Let's give him a round of applause. Additionally, I would also like to acknowledge Torshea Maxwell Anderson, Executive Director of OSCI. A round of applause for Torshea. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our esteemed guest, Ms. Terry McMillan. One of America's most beloved and critically acclaimed authors, Terry McMillan became the empowering voice of a generation of women with her New York Times number one bestseller, Waiting to Exhale and How Stella Got Her Groove Back. Known for irreverent, pitch-perfect tales of women's lives, Macmillan's seven bestsellers are rich in fearless wisdom, heart-touching characters, and unforgettable stories of friendship, healing, intergenerational bonds, and women saving their own lives. A passionate champion of growing older by looking joyously forward, Ms. Millen boldly rejects the concept of a midlife crisis. Instead, she evangelizes that anyone at any age can change lanes to reinvent themselves, overcome obstacles, get out of ruts, and pursue postponed dreams. As a speaker, artist, women, of, and woman of hard work, hard won wisdom, McMillan challenges us to tap into our passion, defeat our demons, take care of our whole selves, and never ever take happiness for granted. McMillan's newest novel, It's Not All Downhill From Here, was published in March 2010. The novel focuses on a group of women who went to high school together, but later went down different paths. However, after a loss, they reunited. McMillan illustrates the many challenges these women face and how they pull themselves up through the power of friendship and forgiveness. As a speaker, McMillan dives into the many themes of her books and shares her own personal journey through challenges, relationships, addictions, and health issues. With signature sass and disarming authenticity, she connects two audiences through powerful storytelling and a constant credo. It's never too late to become the person that you want to be. Please welcome to the stage, Ms. Terry McMillan. to see the snow. <laughs> you have no idea. But thank you all very, very much for coming. Um, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to read from two different things. I have a new book uh, that I'm revising. Uh, it's called Safety, ironically enough, but it has nothing to do with COVID. Um, but I'm going to read just a little section of this, my last book. I think it was 50 years ago. I don't know. Um, but so much has happened in three years. It's amazing. Hope everybody in your family is safe. Um, so this book is called, It's Not All Downhill From Here. And I will read a little bit of this just to get, just a little bit. But the one that I'm more interested in is this one. And I'll start, okay? Yes. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. I don't want another surprise party. This is one about old people, okay? <laughs> um, I don't want another surprise party, which is just one reason why a few weeks ago when my husband Carl called while I was walking our dog BB King to the dog park and asked what I wanted to do for my birthday this year, I politely said, baby, let's try to figure out how to get our second win. At first, Carl high-pitched chuckled like he was a soprano or something, and then he said, well, we need to vote. I chuckled right back, even though I was serious as a heart attack. Don't you worry, Miss Lowe, I've got you covered, he said as he hung up. I knew he really didn't get my drift. What I meant was, since we both had more days behind us than we had ahead of us, how about we try to figure out what more we can do to pump up the volume? It's not that our life is boring, or well, maybe it is, a little, but even though we do we don't do very many things that generate excitement. 
I still love him more than my prisoners. Carl is a retired contractor who refuses to retire. And after 30 years of all work and no place, selling hair and beauty products in two stores too many, I don't exactly qualify as a thrill a minute either. I released B.B. King's leash inside a dog park, but he just stood there shivering as if he were waiting to be invited to participate in some activity that didn't require him to run or jump. In human years, he and I will soon be the same age, 68. His whiskers and eyebrows are peppered with gray, but unlike me, B.B. doesn't dye his hair. He is our third German Shepherd, and I don't want to think about how long it'll be until he doesn't want to or can't hop in the back seat of my Volvo station wagon, which I will drive until, like me, it stops running. I sat on the green metal bench and watched him sniff a friendly ch chocolate poodle, and I realized I was hoping and praying I wasn't going to have to sit through yet another lackluster party where nobody even thinks about dancing until they hear a song you have to be damn near 70 to remember, which I suppose now includes me. And that that's if you call doing the cha-cha-cha and flats or espadrilles or two-inch wedges with rubber soles to a beat they all hear differently, dancing. I don't. I watch music videos on YouTube. I find myself rocking my future size 12 hips, swinging and swaying my shoulders and popping my fingers to the likes of single ladies or uptown funk by that little cute Bruno Mars until I have to wipe my forehead. I have not forgotten how to dance. In fact, sometimes Carl will sit in his leather recliner and lean way back and just watch me swirl around in my three inch heels, which I wear to work every day because I like to appear glamorous. And in those moments, I feel pretty and sexy and 40. Carl just nods his head like he's agreeing and pops his fingers until the smile on his, on his luscious lips begins to disappear. Then he might hold up his index finger, suggesting that I give him a minute, but don't stop dancing slowly and slowly push himself up to a standing position and limp down the hallway to take one of his little blue pills. Oh hell. Here I go again, meandering. I'm just gonna have to stop apologizing for it because from what I've learned reading my AARP newsletter, this is only the beginning. Though truth be told, forgetting what I was talking about and going off on a tangent isn't completely new to me. Back in my 20s, I smoked a lot of reefer with my friends. We'd all sit in a circle on the floor on giant pillows and have deep conversations about the purpose of life or something having to do with God or how we were going to change the world. But then we'd stop, all stop talking because we were suddenly mesmerized by that lava lamp. <laughs> then somebody would realize they were one step away from freaking out and would jump to a standing position in order to snap out of it. And then they'd ask, what the fuck were we just talking about again? <laughs> And since not one of us had a clue, we just started passing the joint until the next philosophical inquiry overtook our minds. Thank God. I got tired of thinking about things that didn't matter and realized I liked the way I felt when I wasn't under the influence of anything. And when I didn't like how I felt, it was a hell of a lot easier than easier to figure out how to deal with it when my head was clear. Anyway, now I'm a certified senior citizen and my mind has earned the right to go wherever it wants. So I decided that when I can't remember something, it must not have been that important anyway. But sometimes, when I do remember, it feels like an accomplishment. <laughs> okay. okay, so this one is, this, my new book is called Safety, and it's not about COVID, and it's not about old people. Uh, is there any water? I'm sorry. Um, is some here? Yeah, there's some under the podium as well. Duh. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to read my new I just told you the new book is called Safety. And I have about 415 pages which is the whole book, but I'm revising it, which is what my middle name is. And um, how many of you in here have done term papers? So you know what it's like. You think it's good and then you find out it's not. <laughs> anyway, I'm gonna just read this. Um, this is 
The first chapter is called Swinging Glass Doors, and I'm not going to tell you anything about it, but I'll be finished soon. <laughs> Excuse me. And plus, there was no dialogue in this, but it's the last, sort of like it, when you have two kids, both of them are kind of one of you wait to, you're waiting for him to get out of the house. Um, anyway, can't you read? Yvonne asked a scrawny black man with a strange brim cocked to the side like he was somebody worth waiting on. Whoever he was trying to impress with his blast from the past get up sure wasn't in here. Purple shirt, white tie, shiny pinstripe pants she hadn't seen since her uncle Peanut stopped ironing his with spray starch. And that was almost 30 years ago. Yvonne was scared to look at his shoes. Maybe he just gotten off a of Greyhound and stopped off here before he made it to his kinfolks or ex-wife's because Yvonne knew just about every black, white, Asian, Jewish, and Mexican who walked through those swinging glass doors of Cecil's famous downer on a regular basis for almost a quarter of a century. But he had asked her a stupid question. What does we never close mean? At first she thought he was kidding and then she realized he was serious as a heart attack. How many hours in a day, she asked. Let me think about that for a minute. It used to be 24. At first she thought he was just trying to be funny, but then she thought, what if he wasn't? Well, I stopped by here last night about 11 o'clock and you were closed. Well, due to circumstances outside of our control, we are not closing at 10 until further notice. Why? That's really none of your business. <laughs> Why do you have to be so mean? Did you get up on the wrong side of the bed this morning or something? Eva, Yvonne didn't bother answering his brother who looked like he was either from another planet or stuck in a time warp. In fact, she had gotten up on the wrong side of the bed, even though the left side had been had not been slept in, which was why she was not in any mood to chit-chat and why she started spraying Windex up and down the silver and black formica counter like they were bullets forcing him to lean backwards. Has Cecil been robbed or something? No, we have not. You see the man with the gray afro sitting on the stool next to him with the right next to the coat rack and hat rack, coat and hat rack? He turned to look at Hunch, whose real name was escaping Yvonne right then. Whatever his name was, turned to look. Hunch, who worked the evening shift at Cecil's, at Cecil's undercover security guard, even though he spent most of the time talking to people he knew had nobody to eat with or worked a night shift, which were sometimes one and the same but all of them needed company while they devoured liver and onions and rice, white rice or fried chicken and mashed potatoes and spaghetti and meatballs or hamburgers and fries and on Fridays and Saturdays, chili or gumbo. At that moment, Yvonne was thinking Hunt should have been home by now to get a few hours of sleep before heading to his second job as a sky cap for American Airlines, but Yvonne knew he probably slept on three chairs in the overflow party book club room because somebody, sometimes he didn't feel like going home to his bossy wife. And right now, Hunch was doing a crossword puzzle, which was why, which he was very good at. And at six foot five, he didn't feel it was necessary to carry a gun, but he did have a club, which Hunch made sure was always visible, even though he never had to use it. Mr. Bojangles swirled around on the shiny black vinyl stool, looked around the diner and seemed to understand why Hunch didn't look like he was expecting any trouble. Does he carry a gun? No. Then what purpose does he serve? He is here to protect us in case there is trouble, which we rarely have. He doesn't look like he could protect too much of anybody. His hair is almost as gray as mine. He was getting on her nerves. And Yvonne was already running late this morning and not because she had to stop by the grocery store to pick up supplies. No, she'd been waiting for, her lock, for the locksmith to change the locks on the front, back, and side door since Wallace, her husband of 26 years, had not come home again. And if her memory served her right, she was now on lock number three, which was why Yvonne had decided she was not having any more keys made for him, which was also why she was not interested in conversating with this fellow by asking, whoops, by asking, whoops, I'm sorry, punch to stand up, so she just rolled. Her eyes, I'm sorry. She just rolled her eyes at him and plopped a roller, the roll of paper towels on the counter, hooked the Windex trigger inside the white sash of her apricot uniform, put her hands on her white cotton hips, looked up and down the counter, then at the soon-to-be-full tables and booths, um, 
booths to see who was listening, not Angel, who was sitting at the other end, not Angel, I'm sorry, who was sitting at the other end but still close enough to hear, but his eyes were glued to the one of the two flat screen TVs hanging from the ceiling, and since he was dirty, it meant he hadn't gotten any work this morning flagging down customers at Home Depot or U-Haul. And not Officer Yang, the handsome young cop sitting next to Angel in his khaki shirt and Bermuda shorts on his second cup of coffee, thick coffee. And most people, most people who parked on the streets in South Pasadena hated him because he rode a bicycle in khaki Bermuda shorts even when it rained and prided himself on how many parking tickets he rode a day, which was why everybody called him Mr. Ticket Mafia. Look, Yvonne said, trying not to press her hands on her hips. It's too early to debate about anything. And back to my original question, where did you come from that you don't know, understand what the word never means? Guess, Buster said, thinking he was flirting as he tried to swivel on his candy apple red stool that no longer swiveled. I'm Buster. Nice to meet you, Buster, but I don't have all time. I don't have time for guessing games right now. And plus, we're about to get busy, Yvonne said, and dropped a long laminated menu on the counter and kept walking. One side was splattered with photographs of breakfast meals all on one plate. Various eggs with burgundy sausage links or bacon with hash browns or buttery grits. Homemade biscuits or white toast. Thick pancakes with a yellow square of melting butter on top and dripping syrup, syrup dripping like teardrops down the sides. On the other side was hunt with lunch and dinner favorites. A bowl of red chili with oyster crackers circling it. Fried chicken with canned yellow corn or stir-fried collard greens, mashed potatoes or candy yam, littered with rice and gravy, salmon croquettes with a, with a star chop of your choice, hamburgers and fries, and the one that pissed everybody off when they ran out, gumbo. Yvonne wondered if maybe she was being rude, which was why she took a few steps back and flipped the menu over to the breakfast side for Buster. But she was not in the mood for dealing with aliens today, not after she'd gotten in in bed last night and falling asleep watching the 11 o'clock news. And when she woke up at five this morning, Wallace's side of the bed had not been slept in again. And after 26 years of marriage, she made up her mind. She made up her side of the bed, showered, decided on her red uniform, then called. Then, oops, I'm sorry, on her red, decided on her red uniform, then called the locksmith whose number she knew by heart. Yvonne, had been meaning to divorce Wallace for the last 10 years, but just hadn't gotten around to it. But on the 10 minute drive to Cecil, she had decided it was time to pile no ifs, ands, or buts about it. 90% of the time, she was nice to new customers, but it was hard when they were clearly stupid or had a, another agenda other than the one they were holding in their hands, which was the case now. She tried not to stare, even though she was staring at this fellow because she was trying to figure out who he resembled, but not a soul came to mind. He was here for something besides food, that much she did know, but she was not about to ask because she wasn't that curious. What she did know was if she paid him too much attention, he'd tell her his life story. And Lord knew she is not a, she was not in the mood to listen to a whole new saga, and of course a star that was sitting right in front of her. Morning, Teddy, she said to the 40-year-old busboy and dishwasher who moved, mostly moved and smiled and grunted hello without making eye contact even to Yvonne because after a drunk driver hit Teddy on his way home from college, a college football game, landing him in the hospital for two months, Teddy's future as a wide receiver was gone and his speech was forever impaired. And after 18 years of working at Cecil's, he was still embarrassed. When some words came out wrong, which was why he often looked down, down or put his head, uh, hand over his mouth when he spoke. But no one seemed to notice or care, which was why Teddy was not short on smiles or laughter. As usual, he rushed past Yvonne like he was late, which he was not, and pushed open the swinging door to the kitchen. And he, took, he still takes his medication, but Yvonne still doesn't know what it's for and has never had the nerve to ask. She set a glass of water down in front of Buster with fake tenderness. If you don't close, why doesn't the signs just say open 24 hours? Because everybody knows it. The lights are always on, cars are in the parking lot. You see that sexy young lady over there with the purple braids that just walked through the door and should have been here a half hour ago asked, standing behind the pulpit and already texting on her telephone, cell phone? Who could miss her? Nobody does. And even though she, it's a sexist thing to say, it's why she's here.
Tell me something, what's the difference between being sexy and sexist, if you don't mind my asking? Yvonne looked at him thinking he was joking, but that's when she saw those leather brown creases across his forehead rush to meet each other. So she decided to cut him some slack. Sexy is considered to be a compliment, and sexist are men who are too stupid to respect that we have other qualities they can't see. I don't know if you're trying, if you're going to be coming back, but in case you do, enjoy looking at Mink at the, today because her days are numbered. Anyway, she's good at keeping a riff ross, rip, riff raft to a minimum, and to be honest, I don't know if she'd have let you in. Where was it you said you were coming from? I didn't. Are you visiting? No, I've been away about 22 years and now I'm free. You mean you've been locked up? I suppose that's one way of looking at it. Did you kill somebody? No. Armed robbery? No. Then what? Let me just say it's how long it took to prove I was innocent. Isn't everybody, Yvonne said and wish he hadn't. I'm sorry, what is your name, Buster? Do you have a last name, Buster? No, he said and chuckled. Well, Buster, welcome home. What are you gonna do now that you're free? Get used to it, are you married? Yes, happily. Where's your ring? He rubbed the new growth on his chin, the gray ones, even coarser and more plentiful than the black ones. Not that it's any of your business, but it's a one carat diamond too big to wear in here. Why don't you think about what you have a taste for, Buster? FYI, I am not on the menu, sweetheart. Buster's eyes widened hearing that. And Yvonne wished she hadn't said what she just said, and she also wished she hadn't thrown her wedding ring down the garbage disposal so she could flash it like a police badge, and maybe this fellow who looked like he had been stuck in a time warp would not even think about flirting if that's what he thought he was doing. She made a mental note to buy two or three carat replacements at Target as soon as her shift was over. Then again, she thought maybe it was better if strangers thought she was available, but Lord, not this one. And FYI, I'm not on the men men menu, sugar, she said, and strutted off towards the kitchen, grateful for the distraction. So she could stop conversating and get away with this creep, get away from this creepy crawler, even though somebody who eats and works at Cecil's might find him attractive. attractive. Tallulah, she yelled at the waitress who had a propensity to flirt with men and women, even though she only slept with men, but Tallulah got a charge, turning anybody on and pissing off their home, their homely or overweight girlfriends and boys. And today she was wearing her hot pink uniform. She had him so it stopped at the soft starting line of cellulite that circled her thighs, which screamed, no, I do not exercise. I wouldn't even consider it. <laughs> I'm coming, she said in her usual starchy voice. Dusty Winters, who crossed her smooth brown, brown arms and said, I just have what she scrambled. I just have scrambled eggs with tomatoes and no, and, and no toast. Now go see what she's talking so loud about. That's it. <laughs> it's just the opening. Um, and this book is about the people that eat it, that eat it, um, this diner and it's some characters, that's all. And thank you for listening. And so I can go sit down. Which here? Oh, Lord. Okay. Is this yours? McMillan. Um, now we will be opening up the floor for questions. Does anyone have any questions regarding the readings that she just read? are both the ones you referred to, but I sure would like it if you would sign these for me at some point. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry? What I did 
just read has not been published yet. It's not a finished book. But thank you. Yes, I will sign. Are there any other questions? Come to the microphone. Please. First off, good afternoon. Can you talk a little bit loud? So first off, good afternoon. Here we go. Is that okay? Yes. Okay, awesome. Um, so you had mentioned this earlier. In regards of... Um, Wait, hold, hold, push, push it up again because he was loud a minute ago. Yeah. Okay. There. Do you want me to actually just take it off? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay, how's the sound? Good. Awesome. <laughs> okay, so in regards of what you had mentioned before, um, when would you say the last time was when you had reunited with your friends that you used to? When I you know, what? When was the last time that you guys had your um, when you reunited with your friends back in high school? Oh, because you mentioned that before. Like, how long has it been since you had that reun? Since you guys had that reunion? Ooh. I don't even know if we still do it anymore. I'm serious. I mean, after X number of years, it's a little boring. Because um, I went to one, and you don't even recognize folks. A lot of people don't show up. Um, when you first graduate, at, not long after, I think I've only done one, maybe two. I can't remember. Um, it, it, you know, I don't, I don't mean to sound crass or anything, but people kind of, um, they grow up. And high school isn't as important to them. As, and it doesn't mean high school itself, but the, the, the people, everybody's lives change. You'll find out one day. Um, you, you, you know, people live all over the world, all over the United States, and sometimes, I gotta, <laughs> um, sometimes, I, I, don't, I don't even know, I mean, it's one thing to remember where you, oh, no. It's one thing to remember where you came from, and it's an, another thing to realize that our lives do evolve, and everybody that was important to you at 14, 15, 16 isn't as important to you at 40, or 50, or 60, or 70. Um, and it doesn't mean that you don't care, but our lives change, and I mean, if you know what you're like, I mean, what was like in middle school is different than high school. And you know, you get married, you have kids, and your life is about the present, not so much the past. And the people that are supposed to be in your life, they are usually in your life. True. And a lot of people, a lot of adults, you know, um, and especially because I got became a little popular, you know, a lot of people would sometimes show up or, you know, and there's a part of me that think the reason, I mean, they were very proud of me, but um, I don't know. You, you develop, I mean, I think our life really goes in cycles where we, you know, you, if you go to college, you go to college, yeah. And you meet a whole new set of friends. And, and people that are in your life. And then from there, it just continues to expand. Because a lot of the people that I, that I hang out with now, or even if, at my age, I don't really hang out, but um, the things that we do together, I mean, I have some friends that I've known, we are still friends after like 40, 40 I, don't, not, I wasn't saying about it, 40 or 50, I have finished. <laughs> okay, so I wasn't gonna say that bad word that you thought, no. But, so I have friends that I've known for centuries, and we just know, and some male friends, that we are, we, we are family. It's, we don't think of ourselves as friends, you know? Don't you guys have people like that? Some of you yes. young students, maybe you, you may not yet. But, and then there are people that you don't miss. There are people that you aren't even curious about. <laughs> um, and that's just the way it works. So, 
Why, why did you ask that question? <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I'm not trying to be snarky. Oh, you're fine, but the mic isn't even on, so <laughs> that's uh, interesting. Uh, it was yeah. just, okay, there we go. Um, it just uh, crossed my mind, like, when you had mentioned that you were um, just chilling with your high school friends and you guys were, like, doing whatever it, is, whatever it was that you were doing. Um, <laughs> it pretty much just made me think, you know, um, like, in high school, everybody has their own experiences, and based on, like, their buildup, it does um, play a part in paving the way for their own future. Like, I know that back in my high school, I never really did any of that, but um, I was more so just uh, introverted, yet that's completely different than how I am now, um, based on the experiences that I've gained in college and, like, experiences that I've had outside, like, when it comes to, like, work experience or even um, university experience. Um, it just it just made me think overall that everybody has their own perspective and that those perspectives continually um, um, it continuously um, increases depending on like where they're um, set to go forward on if you if you catch my drift. <laughs> drift? <laughs> <laughs> Haven't heard that one yet, huh? I don't understand what question you're asking. <laughs> it's I okay. I'll so, so you did answer the question. I'm just saying that I had the question because of what you had mentioned. It just made me, it had me pondering on um, like my own experiences pretty much. And I wanted to hear your perspective on what you had mentioned before in regards of like hanging out with your high school friends and like, um, like how it's been since like your last reunion. See, I thought that I, would, I kind of answered that in that our lives evolve and yeah. we meet new people we move from the place that sometimes that we grew up, that we went to college, and you become estranged, you develop new friends. And sometimes it can be people in the workplace, but just, you know, I mean, I grew up in Michigan. I left Michigan when I was 17, and I moved to Los Angeles, and I went to junior college there, and then I got accepted to Berkeley, and I went to move to the Bay Area, where I lived for 25 years. I had a son, and... Um, there went four or five of my questions. <laughs> so we're going to keep taking away my questions. Okay. okay. <laughs> but be glad that your life ex expands. It gets bigger. Thank your you, world Aaron. gets bigger. That's what you want. And so my, my name is Effie. I'm from Torrington, Connecticut. But I wanted to ask the question. You did the new book that you're in the process of writing or if, if it has been completed safety. Was that based on people in your, from your journey, um, especially when you talked about the gentleman? And then the second question would be, you know, when it comes down to writing, you know, does it take you, you know, a year or two years to actually come out with your books? Um, no, I don't really, I don't have a time frame. Um, what was the first question about the pair, people in my life? So you just you said you wrote the book Safety that you was just reading out loud to us. Mm -hmm. Was that based on people that you met in your journey no. of life? Or? Okay. No, 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 no. I mean, I'm a good liar on her on paper. <laughs> I can I can I can make up stories. I write about characters that I think I would be really curious about. I can't right now remember um, what even made me choose a diner, um, but. Not right, except for the fact that I know that there are people that cluster together for a lot of different reasons. You know, sometimes it's the job. Um, and I just, I think, I, I did think that um, a diner was a really, a really good venue because all kinds of people come to diners. And I remember I was a graduate student at Columbia and I lived in Brooklyn. And one of the things that I re remember doing, and, and it, didn't, it, it didn't even pop back into my head, I don't even know what prompted it, but one day I started thinking about diners. I mean, out of nowhere, sometimes we don't know where our thoughts come from. And I realized that, wow, when I was in, in, living in New York, 
you know, how many, how many diners that I actually ate, the one in my community and all that. And, you know, I was nosy. I mean, I just sit and listen to some of their conversations and I couldn't believe the things that these people were talking about. I was like blown away. And I used to be a secretary and, and, and I took shorthand. And sometimes I would write down verbatim and shorthand what they were talking about. Not really knowing what I was going to do with it because I was not, I was a graduate, I was a journalism major in uh, Columbia. But I was fascinated by what they shared and what I heard. And, um, you know, fast forward the film 30, 40 years, and it dawned on me that this would be a really good setting to see how people survive when things are going on in their lives and what they share. And so that's what kind of prompted me. And I really, and I, I, I hadn't even thought about it for years. I hadn't thought about diners for, and stuff for years. But I wanted to know, but one of the things that I did re remember was everybody was going through something. They didn't just come there and have coffee and say, oh, what a beautiful day. Well, it wasn't that kind of party. And these people would sit there, they would share their fears, what, what they were going through, even if it wasn't them, it was somebody in their family. And these, this was a safe haven for them. They, don't, they didn't have to worry about being judged and half the time they didn't even eat, you know? Um, and even the people that worked at the diner, they knew all these people. And some of them had been coming there for years. And that's what prompted me to be curious, especially now that, you know, I'm up in age, I don't go to a diner, but um, I just thought that there was a wonderful venue that people could share intimately, especially when they aren't being judged. When somebody can just hear what you have to say and, and, and I mean, I, I don't even know what made me remember a lot of this stuff. Um, but it's important to me, because probably since I'm old now, and I, there are a lot of things, and especially what the young man just asked, it's that we, we sometimes become estranged. Sometimes we don't know who even still cares about us. And, and you don't have to be old for that to happen. Um, to feel that way, but I was just curious about what these people, what their lives are like, and, 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 and what, what their secrets are, and what they tell, and what they keep to themselves. And sometimes a diner is a venue where people can, and, and I, I, I'll, put, I'll put it this way, I remember out of all the stuff, I remember once being at a diner, and somebody was crying. And I just asked this woman, why, was everything okay? And she just said, you know, I remember asking her something about like, why are you crying? And she basically said, and I will never forget, she basically said, I don't know. And I've never forgotten that. And it, we're talking 50 some odd years. But um, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to tell the story um, and what we do to find safety. Thank you. How far we're going to Thank you all for your questions. I'm now going to be introducing Professor Javon Jackson. Professor Jackson is a professor at the, of jazz and the director of the Jackie McLean Institute of Jazz in the Hart School and at the University of Harvard. As a leader or co-leader, Mr. Jackson has participated in 22 recording projects that have included such renowned artists such as Diane Reeves, Cassandra Wilson, Ron Carter, Kenny Garrett, Dr. Lonnie Smith, Les McCann, and Christine, Christian McBride. Javon's upcoming recording project, The Gospel According to Nikki Giovanni, was released on February 18, 2022 on his solid Jackson record label. During his career as a musician, musician, Javon Jackson has toured and recorded with artists including Art Blakely, Elvin Jones, Charlie Hayden, Freddie Hubbard, Donald Byrd, wow. Cedar Wilson, Ron Carter, and Joanne Bolkeen. Give it up for Professor Jackson. Well, number one, I want to thank you for being here. It's, uh, I'm a fan, I'm in awe. I know you think that, oh, you keep calling me a star, you're a star for me, so I appreciate you. <laughs> being here and uh, I love the way you deflect things but um, 
you will have to admit you've had a pretty good career. Can you guys hear him? Yeah. <laughs> they can hear me. Oh. Well, can you hear me? Yeah, I get yeah. it. Okay, great. So, there was something that you said when you were reading that prompted me to ask you one of the questions. I did a concert one time in, in Los Angeles with Freddie Hubbard. I was staying at the Peninsula Hotel. I was going uh, from breakfast and I ran into someone who was there at the concert the night before. He's a comedian. His name was Richard Lewis. He's Richard Lewis. He's still around. Oh, uh, yeah. And so he was just sitting in the lobby. I said, well, are you uh, traveling? He said, no, I live in LA. I said, well, what are you in the hotel? He said, well, I just come here and I just observe people and that's my material. <laughs> so I was, which kind of brought me to what the young lady was saying. Uh, obviously, you have a vivid imagination, but do you? I'm a good liar on paper. Well, I think I just said the same thing. <laughs> but do you uh, allow some of the things that you see in, in, normal, in, in, normal, in, in normal day life, does that shape you sometimes in your writing? Do you allow that to shape you in a literal sense, or um, do you kind of just go off of the uh, things you've experienced in your life? Do you, do, you, do you make a conscious effort to just watch some things and write from that? No. no, uh, -uh. no. That's like spying. I don't want to, you know. No. Okay. I write about what's bothering me, um, and what I'm curious about, and sometimes it's conscious and sometimes it's sub uh, un unconsciously. Um, but whatever seems to be looming large, um, and right now, I don't even really, I don't really, really re for each book. Something else, something different is going on in my life that makes whatever it is that I am writing about or compelled to write about seem important. And it is important enough to me that I want to know why this is happening. Why are these people behaving this way? And I never really have the answer except that I care and I'm. I want to know how we get through things. That's why I do what I do. And, and you know, because life is hard. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care how much money you have. It's still hard because you have to make sense of things. And for some of us, it is hard to make sense of things, and especially when it hurts. And so... Almost every book is an inquiry about that. How do they, these people get through this? Because I'm not going to have them run from it. You know, um, it's how even, even you know, that, that old cliche, feel the fear and do it anyway. It's not that. Because they don't even know, some of us don't know how strong we are until we had, like those folks in the Ukraine. I mean, look at that. I mean, I, I, mean, I was crying this morning thinking, you know, look at this baby. Right. Look at this baby. Look at the mother. You know, and what, what are they, they going to do? do? You know, and I'm saying to myself, what is their life going to be like after this? And a lot of us feel that way for a whole lot of different situations. You know, you get a divorce. Your kid leaves home. You know, even though you know that's what they're supposed to do, but you're like, dang, those 18 years went by so damn fast. <laughs> You know, and, you know, and now, you know, when you're elderly, you know, what am I going to do by myself? What is important? What is it that I still need to fix? What am I responsible for? Why can't I say yes when I mean it? And why can't I say no when I mean it? Um, and, and, you know, as a writer, you know, I mean, I don't feel like I have any answers, but one of the things that writing does for me, and which I'm better at on paper, but it helps me in real life, is to empathize with other people. Because some... That's story of my life, but go ahead. <laughs> but a lot of us don't. A lot of us, you know, we lose patience, even with ourselves. And um, we all want the same thing. We all want to be loved and we want to be happy. You can throw money in there, but if you got the first two, sometimes the third one, you know, helps too. But, you know, I don't know. I, it's not hard. It's not hard. I mean, I have eight characters in this story. My editor said, can Terry, can you get rid of two of them? And I said, no. <laughs> I cannot get rid of them. No. And I know what I'm doing. But, um... 
that's what this whole process is about. It's, it's an excavation. Mm -hmm. And some of the characters that I choose to write about, I don't know anything. I mean, I don't know what it's like to have been in prison for 23 years. And, and, and he ends up getting money because it happens to, I mean, I do my research. But he ends up, but you know, he's like 50 some odd years old and he's like, and he had a real job and everything. Um, and, and I'm saying to myself, where do you start? And it doesn't have to be prison. I mean, it's like, you know, your kid leaves home, you lose your job, you're bored with your job, your husband is this, your wife is that. And, you know, people move away, you realize you're by yourself. And, and it's like, wait, 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 wait. And some people have jobs, they don't have careers. Some people have jobs that they don't like or they do like. Some people have careers, they think, damn, I made a mistake. This was not all I thought it was gonna be. It's not doing it for me. And so there are a million things to write about, but most of what all of us go through that we have to address is change. We just do, and especially when we don't ask for it or when we don't expect it. Absolutely. You know? Thank you. I mean, Thank you. Let me ask you this. Growing up, what were some of the uh, authors or were you that you read, books that you read that inspired you at all? Well, when I was growing up, I mean, uh, I worked, I was 14, I worked at a library. And um, James Baldwin was the first one. And back then, we didn't have very many black writers on, on the bookshelves, okay? And, um, you know, there are too many writers over the years that I love. And I could sit here and name them, but everybody in here knows who they are, to be honest with you. And plus, when I have to do that, I mean, if I name some people, people say, well, damn, she didn't say him. She didn't say him. So just take it that I'm well read. And, and I don't just read off books by black writers. I read all kinds of folks. And um, you, you pretty much know, because I wouldn't be able to do what I do if I wasn't well read. Because, it, you know, I don't think I'm, I mean, you learn from other writers as well. And they are the ones, I mean, I, I literally could sit here, but I hate answering, ask, and no offense. I hate at, at answering that question, because then, even at my age, too, I'll sit here and I'll start going through my little brain and just think, and then it just slows down. Because I could just name people. And then as soon as I leave, I'll say, oh, shoot. So just take it for granted that the people that you think I've read, I've read. <laughs> okay? And really. Um, and okay, plus, how about this? What are you currently reading? Well, that's another thing. <laughs> when I'm writing a book, I have to, I have to read. I, I can't read other writers, especially writers that I like. Okay. I read in between books, and I, and I, I do I binge read. Okay. That's what I do. And it's hard to read, because it's hard to, first of all, it's hard to read somebody's work that you really like. And I buy them, I have all their books. I mean, I've got thousands of books. And so, and one of the things that I love, and a lot of people don't understand, is when you, a library should not be exhausted. You know, I want to do, because especially after years, I mean, at, when I was a young kid working at a library, I used to go sit and hide in the stacks. And back then they had those dumb waiters, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of them, but I used to sneak in the dumb waiter and read. That's how, where I read James Baldwin. And on the toilet seat, I put my feet up so nobody could tell I was in there. And I spent a lot of time, um, you know, when I read Louisa May Alcott, I was like, is she serious? You know, really? And that's how I started reading. And back in the day, a lot of my friends and family members growing up, they didn't read. Um, they read to do homework. And I was one of them, but at 14, getting that job probably saved my life to be honest with you. So I can, and I, I mean, when you read a lot, and people say, who is your favorite author? I cannot answer that question. I just cannot, because there are too many of them. And the thing, that the beauty to me of reading is when you read a book that changes you inside, and you don't even realize it until you're finished, that you are left with something that helps you feel bigger, better, whatever. And I'm running my mouth too long. No, you're doing good. I just, uh, I want to be respectful of our the young, um, the young people. So the young they'll beat me up after you're gone. So we're going to get them up here. 
Okay. Okay. <laughs> You did, but I, I just again thank you for being here. This has been a long process for us. You reaching out to you, and we're just happy that you're on the stage. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Professor Jackson. I would now like to introduce our student panel. Our first panelist is Lillian Bertram. She is from East Hartford, Connecticut, and is a sophomore in the Barney School of Business, majoring in entrepreneurial studies and minoring in teacher education. Lillian aspires to be to open a nonprofit focused on promoting education equality. Lillian is the outreach coordinator of the Commuter Student Association, a member of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Planning Committee, a member of the Hartford Hawks Service Scholar, and an intern for the education organization Connected Kids. In her free time, she enjoys writing and is a published author of the poetry book Naked Thoughts. Our next panelist is Sydney Coleman. Sydney is from Bridgeport, Connecticut, currently an undergraduate senior studying psychology and politics. She is a Dorothy Goodwin Scholar through the Women's Advancement Initiative and is in the process of creating a documentary on the hereditary links of trauma within the black community. Give it up for Sydney. <laughs> next we have Deja George. Deja is currently a sophomore double majoring in politics and government and philosophy and is from Westchester, New York. Her areas of research include neo-colonialism in the British Caribbean and Negro politics in the United States. Additionally, she is an ambassador for the College of Arts and Sciences and works within Res Life as the graduate area manager. Deja has previously served in SGA as Hall Call Senator, Chief of Staff, and is now serving as my Executive Vice President. In her free time, she enjoys traveling, trying new foods, and reading and listening to music. Give it up for Deja. Last but not least, we have Alba Marcelin. She is originally from Providence, Rhode Island. She is currently a junior studying aerospace engineering with a minor in mathematics. Alba serves as a VP of the New Heart chapter of the National Society of Black Engineers. She has dreams of becoming a commercial airline pilot. Alba is looking forward to the warm weather and her upcoming internship this summer at GE Aviation as a systems aviation intern. Round of applause for all of our amazing panelists. Feel those ways? How do you channel that emotion that you want to write about? Well, one, sometimes you, I mean, I, it's hard to say this for somebody that's really young. I, I think, I'll say this because I started out writing poetry, and the only reason I wrote poetry was when I was pissed off, hurt, something. And I had a whole lot of poetry. Um, but, um, I didn't realize that was what I was doing. So one, stop keeping score. And write whenever you feel like it. But when you write about pain or disappointment, which most writing really seems to be about, um, otherwise it's like a fairy tale, um, and what you end up writing can save you. So I wouldn't beat myself up, especially as young as you are, and uh, you know, and the beauty of it, though, is this is young people are the ones who want, they want to figure the shit out. You know, they want to know the answers to this. And the beauty of writing is that it's, it's a cluster and you don't necessarily have to know the answers. You really don't. And being able to capture what it is that you're feeling, if it's sadness, sometimes you come to learn and understand and respect that sadness. But also, if you ask yourself questions about what it is that makes you sad versus what makes you feel good, you can write about both. But, you know, writing fiction, is a, it is an excavation. And 
sometimes some things early on you keep to yourself because they're not definitive. They don't necessarily have to answer any questions. You know, and if you're hurt, you're upset, you're disappointed, own it. Because you're not always going to be depressed or sad or pissed off or whatever. But when you are, capture it. And also it gives you something to, there's some space in there where you get to go back and look. Just put it someplace and realize, wow, that's how I was feeling. You know? And sometimes when you step back from anything, I don't care what it is, you get distance, and that distance can also make you make it closer to understand. <laughs> but you didn't hear it from me. <laughs> uh, so I'll ask you the next question. Uh, and what I really want to know is how do you define your success? And how do, I what? How do you define success? And what was the moment that you consider yourself successful despite outside influences? Despite what? Outside influences. Uh, first of all, let me just say this. I think that, um, let me see how I put this. I have never thought of myself as being successful. I, I can't remember thinking, gee whiz, I've made it. <laughs> um, that's, that's really sad. It's really sad, and it's a horrible way to measure your value. It's a horrible way to measure it, because it means you are always, com you're comparing yourself with other people. Don't do that. Um, also, it's really not important. What's important is how you feel about what you do, what you are contributing to the world, and whether or not it makes you feel better as a human being. And if you compare yourself to other people, you're already messing things up. You're already making, dealing with insecurities that are totally unnecessary and to some extent manufactured. Mm. You know, so ask that, ask that question one more time. Just seriously. I, I was, yeah, so I was asking, how do you define success? And then when was the moment that you considered yourself successful despite outside of I don't know. I don't know. Everybody else was, you know, I, 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 I've never thought of myself, I never, first of all, I never thought of myself as a, as a writer. Even when I first, my first novel was called published, I was just grateful. You know, that, that, you know, but I've never thought of myself as, gee whiz, one day I, I swear on my mother's grave, I have never, ever, ever thought about being a best-selling author. That was not one of my goals. It wasn't something I was striving for. I mean, I've never. It didn't dawn on me. And now a lot of young people, that's what a lot of them, that they, the way they de define success is the way other people define it. Don't fall for that shit. You know, when, when, when you do what, you're, what you feel in here, and everybody's not gonna be a best-selling author. Like I said, it was not a goal of mine. And back when I was first starting to write, it wasn't that many of us out here, not contemporary writers. You know, so nobody was more shocked than I was when, which by the time I got the waiting to exhale, I was like, when they kept telling me, it got to the point where every week, you know, your publisher calls you to tell you where it is on the list, the New York Times bestsellers list. And after about 10 or 15 weeks, I said, stop calling me. I don't want to know because I was shocked, but also it was sort of like, I mean, I was flattered, but the bottom line is, is after 34 weeks, I was like, come on. It's like, which one of your babies is cute? <laughs> you know, the first one or the second one. And I mean, I was like, I'm not, I'm not, that's, you know, I'm happy and all this, but that's not what this was about. I'm glad that people are embracing it. And, it, and you can't put a number on that. And don't let it be, don't even let it take up space in your head. It's a waste. And it can drain you, it can rob you of some of the stuff that you need to keep doing and feeling and acknowledging what's in your heart and what's in your gut. And do not compare yourself to anybody else. Did that answer your question? <laughs> I guess I'll go next. Um, your best-selling novel, Waiting to Exhale, 
covers many themes, including the songs. Covers what? Covers many themes. Many themes. Themes. Okay, the nasty. I'm sorry. Um, including self-esteem and love through racial and social complications. What advice would you give young black women and men as they search for healthy love and success in the world of adversity? Honor what you feel. Oh, honor it. And you know, honor what, what you feel. Because, and even if it turns out not to be the right thing, the bottom line is this life is not over. But I mean, when my son, who is now 37, um, brilliant, Stanford grad, now in master of uh, the MFA program at UCLA that I'm paying for. And, um, <laughs> but he, he's wonderful. And I mean, I always told him, even when he was much younger, and I told him I'll never forget it. Um, I told him, and he was called himself making me a steak. I will never forget it. He was eight years old. And I said, because his, his third, I think it was third grade, yeah, his third grade teacher was gay. But the kids didn't know it, but I knew it. And so I just said to him while he was burning that steak, and he was frying it, which I had never seen, but I don't know. And I said, so, because we had had a te te teacher conference, whatever. And I said, Mom just wants you to know something. And he said, what, Mom? And I said, I just want you to know that when you grow up, if you like boys or girls, both are okay. And he said, what? And I, I said, you heard me. Some boys like boys, some girls like girls. It is okay. I don't want you to feel like you can't tell me because it is okay, okay? The other thing is, is I said, and when a girl says no to you, because also this was like, this is a little later, but Mike Tyson, after when, when he did it with a girl that put Washington, young Washington, and I said, and I want you to know something too, when a girl says no, she means it. That's all I have to say. But say your question again, I'm going off. What advice would you give young black women as they search for like healthy love? As they what? As they search for healthy love. Oh, success. first of all, the other thing is this. You don't search for love. That's your first mistake. <laughs> I don't know where it is. I mean, I mean, I know what oh, social media is one thing, but you know, they spend more time online than anything. Um, I would just say, be whoever you are, and be open to exploring different kinds of friendships. First of all, but if there's somebody that you find that you might you know, somebody that makes your heart flutter or whatever, say something. Don't wait for them to say something to you. That's what being liberated means. Um, you can be honest about how you feel. And so what if somebody doesn't respond? And so what if they don't say no? You'll get over it. Um, and when you're young, you're gonna get your heart broken and you might break somebody else's heart. The world does not end, even though it may feel like it. But, um, Think of it as an adventure, and that you're getting to know somebody that you didn't know. And there are things about people, because you can't like everything about everybody. Yeah, it's not gonna happen. You got marriages that have been, people that have been married for centuries. There's things about each other that they still can't stand, but they love each other. And it's not a deal breaker. And um, have some fun. That's the most important thing, have some doggone fun. Because you've got the rest of your life to be miserable. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't mean that literally. I mean, I mean, I mean I'm being facetious, okay? But the bottom line is that so many people always worry about the future and what is going to happen next. Now, how about right now? Amen. How about right now? Amen. Do what you can do right now to make yourself feel whole and feel good. And sometimes what you ultimately end up doing is attracting somebody who feels the same way. Mm -hmm. They don't have to feel the same way about you. Uh, but the bottom line is, is that life is hopefully long. It's a journey. And how you excavate it determines on what you get out of it. And, and a lot of young people now are a, a lot more impatient than when I, when I was your age. You know, we didn't think about success. We weren't thinking about that. We were just thinking how we were going to get, be, stay on the honor roll so our parents wouldn't be pissed off at us. You know, and, and then as a result, um, 
you, you, you know, I mean, like I said, I got a job working at a library. I didn't know, I mean, that library changed my life. Those books changed my life. And, you know, you're, you're gonna, you, sometimes we get what we want, sometimes we get what we earn, sometimes we get what we deserve, and sometimes we get what we didn't even have an idea was possible. And that's what the beauty of this whole thing for life is, is the possibilities. And you shouldn't have it all figured out at 20. You don't have it all figured out at 20. Even what you like now, you'll find out in 10 years it pisses you off. <laughs> or it doesn't, it doesn't lift your helm anymore. So just enjoy the journey. That's what a lot of people, they get so impatient at young age. And just, you know, because one thing you can, God gave us capacity to do is change our mind. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and respect that. And this whole journey. Because, I mean, I'm 70 years old. I can't believe I'm 70 years old. And I still feel the same way. I mean, I still, I don't feel like, I mean, like right now, I mean, I've been divorced and all this. And, you know, and, and even had a wonderful conversation with my ex-gay husband. Two nights ago, he sent me pictures of his niece, granddaughter. I mean, his niece, great niece, whatever. And it's like people still can't believe we're friends. And, you know, and as quiet as it's kept, and I'm just using this as an example of how many years can go by and you don't hold grudges, even though I, I wanted to kill him. Um, but I don't, I, I don't feel, I haven't felt like that in a long time. Plus, he didn't get my money. But um, <laughs> the thing is, is that Life is, I, and that old cliche, life is what you make it. I'm not even talking about that. I mean, when you're young, you have expectations. Some of them are realistic and some of them aren't. And give yourselves permission to grow and to change your mind because at 20 and 21, it shouldn't already be made up. Yes. So, uh, how involved were you in the film adaptations of your books? Slide that down just a little bit. Okay. Say that. So, um, how involved were you in the film adaptations of your books, and was your writing process different? Was I, was I what about the difference? Was your writing process different if you were like more involved or less involved? Well, first of all, um, I wasn't really involved in the movies. I I think I wrote part of Waiting to Exhale, but. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Yeah. Ask the first part of the question again. That was one How question. involved were you in the oh, film? Oh, and say the second part again. And uh, was the writing process different? Did you the approach? writing process, you mean, for the screenplays? Mm -hmm. First of all, I didn't, write any, I didn't really write the screenplays. I co-wrote one, and that was it for me. Because it's not fun. You know? Um, I, I, you know, somebody else that was really kind of famous told me, Terry, don't take this shit seriously. Take the money and run. And that's pretty much what I did. And because the, the, book, the book is never going to be the same as, the film is never going to be the same as the movie. Now, Waiting to Exhale was a little different because of who starred in it and all that. And I, I co-wrote it, and that's when I also, that's when I was told not to do it. Let me tell you, never again. And I didn't do it again because it was not fun. And I knew I had already told the story I wanted to tell. And um, it's not all it's cracked up to be. It really isn't. But the money is great. <laughs> um, but, I don't, but also, you don't think that far. And I know a lot of young writers that do. They write a novel thinking, it, thinking that it's going to be a movie. I mean, I know some of them. And um, it's just not, you know, do, do what's from here and here and here. And hopefully they both merge. You know what I mean? And, and, and respect that. Fame is not a goal. It should not be a goal. Being rich should not be a goal. Being happy should be a goal. And if some of those things help aid in that, then you're on the right track. But it's, it's you know, it's just not what it's cracked up to be. And that's why, I mean, I live in L.A., and I have a lot of friends out there in Hollywood, you know. And, 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 and also, that's all they talk about. It's sickening. It's sickening. 
And right now I have three deals. My first novel, Mom, I only have one book left that's not going to be a movie or something. Mama, my first book is going to be a TV series. And uh, when it, not wait, uh, what's the other one? It's three more of them that are all, Lee Daniels is, is turned Waiting Takes Hell into a television series. And um, I, I don't even know I'm going to watch it. But um, it doesn't really matter. It's like, I did what I did. I didn't know all this stuff was going to happen. I respect it. But, you know, you put your heart into whatever it is that you do. And if all you worry about is money and fame, wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. That's a terrible goal and a very superficial one. You know, you want your life to mean something, not about how much money you made or how famous you got, but that what you do has an impact on somebody else's life besides your own. Mm -hmm. And I don't care, and I'm not talking about cre just creative people. I'm talking about if you're a business person, you know, whatever, but that it's just not about that. You know, because it, it can be very disappointing. And plus you need to find out what you, especially since you guys are so young, you need to find, this is an opportunity for you to find out who you really are. How you, how, so you can, so your evolution, you evolve as you, as you age. Not be disappointed because you didn't get this or you didn't do that. No, that's the wrong gauge to use to measure. Wrong one. You want to be happy. You want to have some fun. You want to travel. You want to say yes. You want to say no. You want to do it again. You want to try it under different circumstances. You know, you want to learn something from the mistakes or learn something from that, you know what, that really doesn't look my him like I thought it was going to. That's what you, that's what this time is about. You know, that's what this time is about. And, and don't worry about getting married. <laughs> Not right now. Take that off the plate. Get as much as you can out of everything. <laughs> Don't get my drift. How are we doing for time? We have one more question. Wait, well, yeah, I'm catching a plane, huh? Yeah. But I want to see the snow. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I want to see. I love it. I grew up in Michigan, so I saw the snow coming in here, and I was like, Whoa. and I, if it's still snowing, I'm going to videotape it. <laughs> Oh, we're done? No. I'm gonna say. Well, it's time for one more question, so. Um, oh, you, so, um, you mentioned earlier about uh, how it was a struggle being like a contemporary. Talk writer. a little louder, honey. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. So um, you mentioned earlier how it was a struggle being a contemporary writer uh, when you were writing, wait, or when you wrote Waiting to Exhale. How was it being a black woman writer in that time period? And also, like, how it's, let me just say it again. Can you start over? Yeah. You, I, I, I can paraphrase yeah. it. She says okay. she, she talks about <laughs> you talked about your struggles of being one of the first writers in a way to exhale, right? Yeah, and also like if it affected you like personally um, or in any way in your development as a writer going forward, being a black woman writer and also a contemporary writer. Being a black woman writer, what? And contemporary writer. What did it do to me? Like if it had any effect on you going forward in your personal growth. Oh. No, not really, because you know why? Because I didn't believe the hype. Um, the fact that, I mean, I, I knew even before all of this stuff that, um, first of all, nobody was more shocked and surprised about the uh, success of Waiting to Exhale. That's why I had to tell my editor, they, the New York Times comes out every week, every Tuesday is when the bestseller list comes out for the following week. By the time we got up to 15, 16, whatever number of weeks, and I said, stop calling me because it was driving me crazy. Um, first of all, it wasn't, and, and, and it, it really was driving me crazy. By the time we got up to 29, whatever number, you know, the, she stopped, but it was like, oh, Terry, you have no idea. You know, and I'm like, first of all, um, it did not have, I think it affected readers more than it affected me because I know that that's that first of all I had no I, I know young people now that write books that they expect to be bestsellers okay I never I mean back in those days there weren't very many of us contemporary and um, that wasn't what was important to me it really wasn't I wanted my book to have 
a positive effect on the people who read it. And I wasn't counting them. Um, and to me, that's a very superficial goal to have. And one that can really destroy you if it doesn't happen. And there are a lot of them out there. But you write from here and here. I already said that. And, and I mean it. And I still do. You know, I mean, these, these people that I'm writing about now, I, I don't know these people, but I'm getting to know them. Well, I got to know them because I wrote the, the, the 419 pages. But um, it's, you know, you write what you're curious about, what you're worried about. What is it about us and the human condition that bothers you? That really bothers you. Not to say that writing can, is, is, is an uh, elixir, that you can just fix it, but the bottom line is it will make you better as a human being if you understand and respect it. That the human condition, that we all go through stuff, but how we get through it is what I'm curious about. You know, what happens when you fall down and you don't think there's anybody there to help you get up. How do you get up? How do you get up? And so if you don't know that about yourself, create some characters that, 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 that gives you the empathy um, to figure out or put yourself in somebody else's shoes that, you know, be Ukrainian, you know, have your babies on your back and they're not in doubt, you know what I'm saying? Not knowing where you're gonna eat if you're gonna live. Think about that. And you know, that's what writing is about. It doesn't mean that you can't laugh and all that, but it's how you not just get around stuff, but how you get through it. Beautiful. If I could just say this real quickly, bringing uh, Terry over in my car, I wanted to uh, get on the phone with Nikki Giovanni, who's become a good friend of mine. And you'll have to accept it. Nikki immediately said, wow, you know, I love your stuff. <laughs> so you got to accept it. <laughs> oh, I, I accept it. I've met her and we have loved and all that. And, um, and I, I, mean, I think I even read one of her poems to her. A long time ago, but of course I can't remember which poem it was. But um, and even Angela Davis, you know, who was also at the school, um, university. Um, I have to say this real quick, real quick. Um, back when I was 17, I was living in Los Angeles, and Angela Davis, when she was at large, mm -hmm. remember they were looking for her, mm -hmm. and I was going to this to do something that, you know, that had to do with pregnancy. That's all I'll say. But I was a I was in, you know, I was only like 18 or something like that, and um, and Angela was at at large, and it was a just fancy smancy area in Los Angeles, and it was a brother who was a um, security guard, and I'm not thinking anything except I'm scared, and all of a sudden this brother says, "Hold it right there," and I said, "What?" And he put his held his gun up, and I said, "What?" He said. Angela Davis, you are under arrest. And I said, fuck you, I'm not Angela Davis. <laughs> I said, I am not Angela Davis. And even if I was, as a black man, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Oh, pulling a gun on me. Pulling a gun on me. She hasn't done anything illegal. And he put that gun back in his holster. And I went on and did what I had to do. <laughs> My mama taught me to speak up. <laughs> So, I'd like to take a moment to thank Valentina for serving as our MC. Mr. Jackson for being in the role of moderator. To our student panelists, Alba, Deja, Lillian, and Sydney. I look forward to seeing the impact you all will make in the world. I want to take a quick moment to acknowledge the individuals behind all the magic of student engagement. I'm going to ask them all to stand. Torshea.
Sarah. Anthony. Fallon. And Susan's up in the booth. Um, we are a small but mighty team. We impact the lives of students in meaningful ways by creating an environment of inclusivity, equity, and belonging. I also want to shout out to our graduate assistants who support us with our efforts. Andrew. Andrew, yeah. Um, Keisha. Taylor and Jasmine aren't here, but they are also um, part of our amazing team. Please give these wonderful people a round of applause. I'm going to ask our Dean of Students to join me. Um, to our esteemed guests, Ms. Terry McMillan, thank you for sharing your time and insights. Thank you for being fierce, unapologetic, and an inspiration to women everywhere, including myself. Your honesty is just amazing. I appreciate that. To you, our audience, thank you for being amazing and spending part of your afternoon with us here at UHeart. Please visit our UHeart website to see our amazing events that we will be presenting as we continue to celebrate women's history and diversity on our campus. I'll turn it over to Erin for final remarks. Okay, I'll just say thank you again uh, for those nuggets of, of wonderful wisdom uh, through your experience in life and, and sharing and spending the time with us. It means a lot uh, to our community here. And I want to thank all of you for coming out. Um, this is our, it's nice to have everybody in person uh, for one of these events. We're looking forward to having more uh, and getting a chance to hear from all of you and share this experience. So uh, be well, everybody take care, and thank you again for coming out.